And, um, that it, you know, I don't know how long it took them to finally get to the point where they started breaking it down and just looking at it statement by statement or phrase by phrase. But, you know, there's, there's wealth and there's benefit in doing that. Because all of Scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for us for teaching, for uh, correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. And so, do it both ways. As Marcus and I were talking about that, we said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting just one Sunday, we'd just read the whole letter. Read it in the entirety, and we said, yeah, that'd be a great idea. This was not that Sunday. I want to break this down. You know, we, we have seen Paul come back to this theme over and over again. We know that the issue that Paul is addressing was this idea that in order to be a good Christian, you had to follow all of the Hebrew law. In essence, you had to be a good Jew before you could be a good Christian. And Paul says that's backwards. In fact, it, it's counter to the truth of the gospel. And so as he's writing this letter, he's giving evidence after evidence and argument after argument as to why that was not beneficial for them to do. When we started chapter 4 in Galatians, we saw that Paul gave us the, um, it, it was the logical argument. We've kind of followed the progression of his appeal here. But he gave us the logical argument. And, and the logical argument, if I could just summarize that real quickly, was that all of the Old Testament law, it was good. It was for a purpose. God gave them the law and the commandments and the rituals and the observances. He gave them for a purpose. But that purpose was that it all pointed to Jesus. All of the Old Testament law pointed to Jesus. All of the rituals pointed to Jesus. The regulations, it pointed to Jesus. And his logical argument is, now that Jesus has come, we don't need the pointer. It pointed us to Jesus. It anticipated Jesus. But now we have Jesus, so we don't need that pointer. Don't, it, it, it's useless to go back. At the end of the chapter, and hopefully we'll get here next week, at the end of the chapter, he kind of gives us the legal argument. And the legal appeal. And at the end of the chapter, starting at verse 21, I love this phrase. Tell me, you who are under the law, do you not listen to the law? My paraphrase is, don't you, ha have you ever actually read the law? And he uses the law to point to the fact that the law points to the promise. And it's the promise that we should focus on. So he's going to give us the legal argument, but sandwiched in between those two things is this personal appeal. He... he, he kind of stops, and he changes his tone just for a minute, and he gives them a personal appeal. Almost to, to the, the point and the effect where Paul says, I, I just want you to understand, I'm not mad at you. He uses some pretty strong language. Some pretty bold, blunt, sometimes even graphic language as he's making this appeal as to why they shouldn't go back and, and, and put themselves under the regulations of the Hebrew law. And, and he uses strong language about those who are insisting upon that. But it's almost as if Paul says to the, to the believers and to the church, I just want you to know, I'm not mad at you. I'm, I'm upset about this situation, but I am not mad at you. And he's motivated, and he wants them to know that he's motivated by his real personal concern for these Christians that he has, that he shared life with. There is a relationship. There is a connection there. And at this moment, he kind of draws on that connection to say, I just want you to understand this. That's kind of what we have. In this portion of Galatians. We're in chapter 4. I want to look at verses 12 through 20. Let me read it for you. This is how it reads in the New American Standard. It says, I beg you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You've done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is the sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. 
But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you. My little children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I wish that I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Did you pick up on some of those personal tones? Just the, the, the familiar relational words that he uses? I want to look at this, uh, dig into this, and unfold it a little bit out of order. We're going to jump around in that passage. But even the terms that he uses to refer to these believers at Galatia. He, he opens this part by saying, brethren. Now, brethren. You know, so why is that significant? Uh, as I said, I, I wonder if Paul says, you know, let, let me just pause here and just reassure you, you're not the enemy. You are not my enemy. I don't hold you as my enemy, as my enemy. In fact, I hold you as my brothers and my sisters in Christ. I, I want you to know that, that it's, this is not something I have against you. And maybe at this point, Paul is responding to some of the criticisms and some of the reports that have been filtering back to him. That those who insisted that they go back to the Hebrew law had to discredit Paul and his teaching in order to change the thinking of those believers. And maybe one of the reports, we don't know, maybe one of the reports is, you know, Paul's mad at you. Paul doesn't like, Paul doesn't care about you anymore. He's just using you. And he's upset that you've listened to somebody else besides. He, Paul is just here for an ego. Trip. Paul says, no, brothers, sisters, my family, I'm not mad at you. I, I, I hold nothing against you. But maybe even more than that, and more importantly, Paul still considers that they have this common bond in Christ. We have this thing in common in Christ. That's what makes us brothers, what makes us brothers and sisters in the Lord. This common bond, this common hope, this common confession that Jesus is Lord. And that holds us together. And in doing that, Paul reminds them of that common bond. But at the same time, he's also reassuring them, I don't think that you've lost that. I don't think you've lost your salvation. I don't think that you are an outsider in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's drawing on that relationship. At the end of that passage, there's another term that he uses that's even more familiar. It's more of a family term. Right there at the end, at verse 20. Uh, back, verse 19. My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, my children. A couple weeks ago, we pointed out that often in the New Testament, that word child is, is really a, has an implication of immaturity, as opposed to a son. A child is immature, a son takes adult status. But we also know that that word child, especially when it's connected with this word my or little children, my children, little children, there, there's a term of endearment there. there. There's a close connection there. There is a fondness that is implied there. And so when Paul uses this word, there is an implied, purposefully implied fondness. It's in interesting. Paul doesn't use that term much. John does. John, especially in his letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he, he's constantly saying, now, my little children, my children, my little children. And maybe that's just because when John wrote those letters, he's old. He's, he's the senior statesman, and he's writing to second, maybe third generation believers. And so there's that natural grandfatherly approach to that. But John is also the disciple of that Jesus loved. He's the disciple of love. And so it's just natural for John to use that. My little children, let, I, I just hold you so dear. This is so important to me. Paul doesn't use that term so much. In fact, there's only two times in all of Paul's letters where he refers to a group of believers as his children. Now, he does that with Timothy individually, and I think Titus also individually, my true child in the faith. faith and, and there's a, that that fondness that's communicated there. But for a group of believers, this, this in one reference to the church at Corinth, he calls them my little children. He does that in connection with this next idea right at the end of the, our passage here. 
He says, I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed about you. My, my, my little ones, my, my dear ones. I, I just, and I take that word perplexed. I guess I would paraphrase it to say this. I just don't know what to think. I don't know what to think about you. I don't know how to feel about this. And, and I wish he would have expanded that a little bit more. Because we could read into that a couple things that just perplexed Paul, that, that he wasn't sure how to process. Uh, I, I don't know what to think about you in regards to how did you get so distracted? I just don't know. You, you were doing so well. And we saw that earlier in the letter. You were running so well. How did you get so distracted? What, what happened? I just I don't understand how you could get so sidetracked. It might be that Paul is saying, I just, I don't know what else to say to communicate the importance of this situation to you. That if you go back to the Hebrew law, you really are minimizing and dismissing everything that Jesus did for you at the cross. I don't know how I can say it strong enough and let you know that it's that important. Case here where Paul is saying, you know, I'm, I just don't know what to think. Because maybe, maybe you didn't really understand the power and the truth of the gospel to begin with. And maybe the perplexity of that that Paul is struggling with is, did I miss something here? Oh, my little children, did I miss something in presenting to you the truth about Jesus? It's kind of interesting to think about it this way. And I, I just remember talking with a, one of the old-time missionaries, and it wasn't so long ago, but going down into South America and into the jungle and traveling into the jungle and up the river and, and establishing himself with a tribe and, and then presenting the gospel. And he said, you know, in those early days, it was, it was great. It was wonderful because we'd go in. We'd go to the village. If they didn't kill us, then we would, you know, we'd have a relationship there with them. We'd make friends with them. We'd present the gospel, and they would receive it gladly. Oh, it was so exciting. The whole village would just receive that and come to Jesus. But then he said later we realized what was happening. That they were just adding Jesus as another layer to their multiple layer religious philosophies that started with animism and then centuries ago the Catholic Church came in and then recently the, the evangelical missionaries had come in and they just layer upon layer upon layer until they were really messed up. Maybe that's what Paul is perplexed about. D did you just Add Jesus to the layers of your religious beliefs up to this point. I, I just don't know. I don't know what to think. But in that, and the point is, in that, we can see Paul's heart really being exposed here. Because this isn't just theological um, and, and doctrinal issues that he's dealing with. He's dealing with those that he genuinely loves and cares about. And he's concerned that they would that they would get it wrong. What is it that gave that personal connection? This passage gives us a, a, just an interesting insight into Paul's life, and at the same time, it gives us an insight as to why there was such, the, such a personal connection. Why does Paul hold these believers with such fondness? Look again. At, at what is it? We're going to start here at verse 14. Uh, verse 13, but you know, it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. And then he says, now, there was blessing there. But where, what happened to that blessing? So go back and just un unfold that for a minute. It was because of bodily illness, Paul said, that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Now, stick with me because this, we're going to do some speculating here. There's some speculation going on here. We're, we're, we're trying to make sense of all this. And we have a little bit of insight into Paul's life. And what is and what was that bodily illness? Now, we know, and kind of came out in our Sunday school class this morning, too, that um, we know that Paul suffered with eyesight problems. Often in his letter, he closes it by saying, look, I've, I've signed it myself with these great big letters. 
because he didn't see well. And, and then part of the, the speculation about that is it was kind of that lingering side effect when he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus got a hold of his life. There was that brilliant light and he was blinded for a season. Some say, you know, maybe this is the lingering side effect or reminder of that. And so when Paul prays three times that the Lord would take this thorn in the flesh away from him, the idea is that Paul says, if you could just restore my sight, that'd make this ministry stuff a lot easier. And that's probably true. But there might be something in addition to that or as a contributing factor to that. So stick with me. Here, here's the idea. Let me unfold this. Acts chapter 13 is kind of the history. It tells how those early followers of Christ just expanded this message of the gospel and how it exploded and how that handful of followers of Jesus changed the world. When Paul comes into the picture, talks about his first missionary journey. And Acts chapter 13 talks about that missionary journey. In Acts chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, we have this description that Paul sailed from the island of Cyprus, this this town, the city of Paphras, on the island of Cyprus, to the mainland, to Perga, which is in Antioch, which is in the region of Galatia. Acts chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. But it's interesting because immediately, and, and we don't know exactly the timing, but it just immediately now he's going inland and to the higher land, highlands. And he doesn't stay and, and preach the gospel at Perga, even though it's a, it's a population center. There would have been opportunity for fruitful ministry there in Perga. But he doesn't stay there. So here's where the speculation comes in. Stick with me for a minute. Speculation is this. We, we know, history tells us, that along the coast there, malaria was prevalent. And so the speculation is that maybe Paul, maybe he had it when he came, maybe he contracted it when he was there, but Paul started suffering from the, the, the effects of malaria. And we know what the effects of malaria are besides the achy and flu-like symptoms. It gets even worse. There's fever. There's fatigue. There's nausea. And then the next layer of that, it's described as debilitating headaches. And those who suffer with migraines could probably testify to this. It was described as like a red-hot poker being jammed through your forehead debilitating headaches, and not just that, but then there were also seizures and leading up to kidney failure. Maybe that explains some of this. The bottom line is, Paul was a sick man. There was bodily illness when he arrived in the region of Galatia. And, and, and so much so that his physical appearance, he, he was in, in, almost in a sense, he was, he was detestable. They, they saw it in him, and they could have been tempted to treat him differently. I think that's what this, this phrase means. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, his, his physical appearance, his condition, his state of health, they could have been tempted to treat him differently, but they didn't. They didn't treat him differently. Two words here are really important for us because they kind of paint the picture. He says, you did not despise me. Verse 14, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise. That, the word that he uses here is the idea of to, to cast out, to, to, first of all, treat as worthless, to consider of no account, and then to cast away, to cast out. And it really is almost descriptive of of the cultural treatment of those who had leprosy. There was a physical, they, they could recognize it, it was detestable, they didn't want to have anything to do with it, they were shunned, they were cast out. Paul says, you could have done that for me. You could have done that to me, but you didn't despise me. It's the next word that I think is really interesting. He said, you didn't despise me or loathe me, or loathe my condition. This is interesting because the Greek word that is used here is a word that sounds like what it means. In English, we have a descriptive word for that. In English, we call such a word an onomatopoeia, or onomatopoetic. And it's a word that sounds like what it means. So like the word buzz, it's a word that sounds like what it is. This Greek word 
is onomatopoetic. It sounds like what it is. And the Greek word is ektio. Ektio. That's the word. What does it mean? To spit. Ektio. Said, and so quite literally, what Paul is saying here is, in my bodily condition, I, I came there, I was sick. I was, I was in bad shape. You didn't cast me out. And you didn't spit at me. Culturally, there's something behind that. The cultural aspect behind that is that, and it was part of the superstition, part of the, the practice, but if you came across somebody who was epileptic or somebody who was suffering a seizure, it was thought that they were being molested by an evil spirit. And to ward off that evil spirit from entering you, what would you do? A tool. You'd spit. Maybe Paul was suffering from seizures. And especially this next phrase, he said, you know what, you, but you didn't treat me like that. In fact, I, I bear witness, I, I'm convinced of this, that if it was possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. You would have alleviated my searing headaches if you had an opportunity. So he's calling on this relationship that was there. He said, you received me. You didn't cast me out. You didn't spit at me. You received me as an angel from God, as Christ Jesus himself. And we, we need to understand that. that. That term angel, it can refer to that created heavenly being or simply in a more generic sense, a messenger. That's the best way for us to understand it. I don't think the Galatians thought Paul was, was a heavenly being. And certainly they didn't think he was Jesus. But Paul said, you received me. With the understanding that I was sent from God. God gave me a message and you received me just like you received Jesus. And I think we take that all together to say there was an enthusiasm for what I had to tell you. And you ate it up. You received it. You received that message of salvation. You received the gospel and you received the messenger. And I bear witness that there was joy. And then he said, what happened to it? What happened to the sense of blessing that we shared? In that even, even though my condition was detestable and I was hurting, you received me, you ministered to me, I shared the gospel truth with you. There was joy. What happened? What happened? Well, here's what happened. And here's the lesson that we want to understand here, maybe the applicable truth that we want to add to that. That an emphasis on rules will rob us of joy. An emphasis on rules will rob us of joy. Now, just be really careful to hear this. And, and we say this all along with that big idea that's on top of your note page there, that there is a place for rules. There's a place for regulation. Rules in and of themselves are not bad things. But don't for a second think that you can gain a right relationship with God or maintain a right relationship with God by how well you follow rules. And I think he's saying the same thing here. That the law is good. The law is good. I, I just think of the Psalms, especially David. It says, the law of the Lord is good. The law is perfect. The law is delightful. Oh, it's, it's even more desirable than, than honey or, or a lot of much fine gold. David said, I walk at liberty when I walk according to the law. The law is good. And so don't think that when we say, Living by rules is a bad thing, but here's the problem. When we make our relationship with Christ simply about following rules, following regulations, joy seems to be the inevitable, inevitable casualty of that. When it just becomes about rules, joy is the one, is the thing that suffers. And I, and I thought about that and wondered, why is that so? And maybe there's a couple of reasons. And, and one, maybe it's this sense of competition. Because if, if it's about rules, then it's really easy to make that about external appearance. And I want to make sure that you think I'm spiritual. And so for me to be spiritual, you have to actually be a little less spiritual. So there's this competition of who looks best. Who looks more spiritual. But you take that another step when we realize that maybe the problem is um, 
this pretense of looking good. I'm so concerned that I look good. I'm so concerned that you perceive that I'm spiritual by the way I live, by the way I follow the rules, that I'm so concerned with pretense that there really is no joy in my life. And maybe even beyond that, with this pretense of looking good and making the relationship with Christ about following rules, there really is no grace. And if I'm neglecting and if I'm forgetting about the grace of God that loves me in spite of how, how I am able to live my life, if I forget about the grace of God, then it's really difficult to treat other people with grace. There's no grace to deal with the people who don't do what you expect them to do. There's no grace in dealing with people who don't follow the rules like you follow the rules. And joy is the casualty of that. Paul said, what happened? By the way, a little later in this, in this letter, Paul's going to give us a couple really solid principles that just bring that home. And it's in the section that we'll get to eventually, but it's the fruit of the Spirit. But these two principles that he contrasts in the fruit of the Spirit is, is this. When you walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit, one of the results is joy. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. But just before that, he says, here's what happens when you walk according to the flesh. And by the way, according to the flesh, and we're going to unfold this later, but according to the flesh, it's not just that you live ungodly lives. It's you're doing it your own self. You're doing it by your strength, by your ability, by your ability to follow rules. And you know what the consequence of that? It's strife and contention. And I think Paul brings that out when he says, what happened to the joy? I bear witness that you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. What happened to that sense of joy? Am I now your enemy by telling you the truth? And I think the contrast of those two statements is purposeful. Where once there was joy, now there's strife and contention. And what happened? Well, he tells them what happened. He says, they... They eagerly pursue you. You've been pursued by those who want to control you. They just want to control you. And it's interesting as we read this that there's an interesting ploy that is kind of hinted at here. Verse 17, they eagerly seek you. They, those are the, the ones who are insisting that the people follow the Hebrew law in order to be followers of Christ. And he says, they eagerly seek you not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Isn't that an interesting ploy? Here's their strategy. They're going to keep telling you that you're an outsider. They're going to keep telling you that you don't belong. They're going to keep telling you that you're not spiritual. So that eventually, if they tell you you're an outsider long enough, you're going to, want, you're going to seek them and say, how can I be an insider? And they're going to shun you. They're going to ignore you. They're going to play hard to get until you chase them. It's kind of the ploy that he's talking about. It's been suggested, and I, I don't know if this is valid, but it's been suggested that really their motive, the Judaizers, the ins, those who insist upon the Hebrew law and all the rituals, that their motive was financial. And it makes sense that if they had to follow all of the Hebrew regulations, then they had to do all the rituals and the sacrifice, and they had to pay the temple tax. They just want more people paying the temple tax. Paul says they're seeking you, but not in, in a commendable way. But it comes back to this familiar, to this fondness. But I'm seeking you. And not just when I was there. I still seek you. And I'm in labor again. I'm just, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. Because I want Christ to be filled up in you. So that you would know the fullness of that. So we come back to the statement he makes at the beginning. He says, become like me. I beg you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. What does that mean? What's his argument? What, what does it mean, by the way, that, that Paul became like they are? Well, I think we understand Paul said, you know, I set aside the tradition set aside my heritage, I set aside the traditions 
for the sake of being able to bring you to a saving knowledge of Jesus. He says it in other places. You know, with the Gentiles, I, I live like Gentiles so that I could win the Gentiles. When I was with the Jews, I lived like the Jews so I could win the Jews. And it's not that he was being less than consistent or he was compromising. He said, yeah, I'm just going to come and do life with you so that I could bring you to a saving knowledge of Christ. He didn't participate in their sinfulness, but he lived with them and lived among them and they did life together so that he could bring them to Christ. He says, I became like you. So here's his encouragement, become like me. And when he says become like me, he's not saying um, be a devout Jew who follows Jesus. I think what he means here more than anything is Become like me, being convinced of the promises of God. Like me, I want you to just be so convinced that God is faithful to his promise that that's what you hold on to and nothing else. That's what I do. And, and as a result, I'm just filled up with, with this joy and, and assurance, being convinced that I have this promise of heaven. I want you to know that same thing too. And it doesn't come by how well we perform. It doesn't come by following rules. It comes by grabbing a hold of the promise of God that was expressed at the cross and trusting Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation. Oh, dear ones. Oh, my little children. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Grab a hold of that. We want to just make that statement here. I'm going to ask our, our elders to come to the front as we do this together.